God said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You, you, know what that, you know what that does to the devil? Hallelujah. I mean, he's back thinking, I've won a victory. And you just get up and sing praises in the midst of it all. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Word of God said, in all things give praise, and we thank God for that. Hallelujah. I, I can go ahead and take a little credit now. I, I taught her that. Hallelujah. When we were just very, very small, uh, I, I come from a singing family. That's why they wonder if I really belong. But uh, we decided, or Missy decided, I was too young to decide, that uh, we were going to sing. And so her first night that she sang, she played the piano, and I sang with her, and she fired me right after that. Hallelujah. I think I remember her saying very distinctly, if I'm to have a, a, a future in music, you cannot make the trip. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> amen. But uh, I love her, and I thank God that she's twice my sister. Hallelujah. You see, that, that's not many that you can say that way twice. She is, uh, uh, shares a common natural DNA, but we share a deeper spiritual DNA. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for your giving. I am going to spend one night and talk about missions and what's going on. I want to say to uh, some very dear friends of ours, Jim and Sharon Hathaway, thank you for being here and thank you for helping us have Missy here. Amen. And also to give honor to where honor's due, this man back here, Jim Hathaway, is probably one of the most faithful givers I have ever met in my life and one of the most faithful servants of God. I met him years ago, and uh, he began to bring me Bibles. And, and he brought me, I, I've carried Bibles that he's brought me. I'm not talking about the, a few Bibles, Bibles by the hundreds, if not by the thousands uh, that he has given me to share around the world. And then when I first met him, called of God, but he wasn't waiting for somebody to ask him to preach. He was down on the streets of Pittsburgh passing out Bibles and tracts, hallelujah. And uh, that got a little hot after a while. They didn't want him doing that, and he moved over to uh, to the uh, what's that Morgantown, I guess, to the university there. And uh, they, he said they don't care what he says there, and he passes out and tells them that Jesus loves him. Isn't that really good that God can have people like that? Thank you, Jim. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles tonight to the uh, I believe it is, if I can uh, find it. Amen. I have a text. I looked it up on the way here. Praise God. <laughs> uh, I, I had the message. I just, this text. Let me see if I can find it here. And we'll see uh, what God would have us to say out of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Boy, that don't look even familiar right there at all. Let me look back over here. Okay. Praise the name of Jesus uh, concerning the gatekeepers. That's what I want. Give me just one second as I find this one verse of Scripture, and here it is right here, and it says uh, down in that uh, 25th verse, uh, no, it's not either, praise God. Boy, that is wonderful, isn't it? It was in here on the way to church, hallelujah. Somebody has stole my text of this particular Bible, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to find it if I have to stay here all night. I know it's there because I want you to hear this particular text, amen. And let's see if we can find it. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not there, amen. Okay, praise God, hallelujah. Okay. Okay, I can quote it for you. <laughs> If you'll go over to the 26th chapter of the book of uh, First Chronicles, uh, you're going to see the title of that chapter is the title of my message, and it talks about concerning the divisions of the gatekeepers. Amen. And in that, it talks about that. It says, uh, at Parbar, westward, four at the causeway, and two at Parbar. Now, I know you don't think that's in there, but it's in there, amen. It simply says this. It says at Parbar, and at Parbar Westward, four at the causeway, and four at Parbar Westward. That's my text. 
That's my text along uh, with the 16th chapter and the 19th verse uh, of the book of Matthew uh, that says one day in the presence of God is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Amen. Is anybody hearing what I've got to say? Praise God. And I want us to stand and ask God to anoint us as we share this word. Father, thank you for your word that is so true and so real. God, I ask you to anoint it with your power and your glory, God. Satan is already trying to steal, but he is a liar, God, and I take authority over him. I take the minds and the hearts of this congregation that they hear the word, the word of the living God, and they are set free by the power and the grace of Almighty God. In Jesus' lovely name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. I, I, I want to share with you something that has really been on my heart of late. And, and maybe I'm just preaching to me tonight. Is that all right if I just preach to me? I, I've uh, had a real change of uh, attitude about ministry and what ministry is all about. I am realizing as I get older that ministry, and some of you have already realized this, you're far ahead of some ministers in this nation. You've realized that ministry never was meant to be that there be a separation between the pulpit and the pew, amen. There wouldn't a, a special group of people that are professional ministers and the rest of us are just sightseers or we're just congregations waiting to pass judgment on those. I believe that ministry is for the entire body of Christ. I believe this revival that is coming up that the Holy Ghost spoke of tonight is going to be a revival that has no superstars in it. Amen. I'll preach it over here. I'm not against any man's ministry, but when we get to the place that we think the anointing is locked up in one man, we have missed the word of God. Hallelujah. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to upset you before I make you happy. I hear people saying, I I can't wait for Benny Hinn to come and I love Benny Hinn. I'm not, not preaching against any man. Understand that. Uh, if we're preaching Christ, I'm not going to touch the man. Do you understand that? But we have people that say, I'm going to go to the Benny Hinn crusade so I can get healed. Why do we have to wait for Benny Hinn to come to the town for us to get healed? Amen. Somebody said, Brother Silcox, it's because he has uh, the anointing or the gift of healing. Uh, he is used in the gift of healing, uh, but I will tell him and anybody else that says that he is not the possessor of the gift of healing because the Bible said in 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter that he divides the gift severally as he wills. It's his gift and he gives it as he wills. Simply put, if there's somebody sick in the house and there's a yielded vessel they can become the vessel through which the Holy Ghost can flow that that light may be touched by the power of God. Amen. Oh come on. We, we were in a revival this uh, year before this and uh, we started on June the 1st. Uh, no, it was on June the 7th that we started. I, I preached at a little church up in Trenton, Georgia uh, coming out of Chattanooga going towards Birmingham uh, right before you leave Georgia and going to Alabama up on Sand Mountain. Sand Mountain is the most populated rural area in America. And I went up and preached at, uh, uh, in, in uh, fact I preached first time I preached there was on New Year's Day and uh, and the pastor asked me the pastor's 82 years old had 32 people in the church uh, and uh, the church was 52 years old and he said would you come and preach a revival it's what we was talking about a while ago about numbers uh, if you're waiting for numbers to have a revival friend you'll have a revival the numbers will come hallelujah so I told him I see, he asked me he said would you come back and preach us a revival and I said I'd be glad to do that and he said if you'll come back in June and preach he said we'll pray for a revival that little church started that day and they prayed three days a week uh, a congregational prayer in the church for revival. We showed up June the 7th uh, and we closed uh, Thanksgiving Day. Hallelujah. There was over 300 people that were saved in that revival. That church is not running uh, uh, 50, uh, not running uh, uh, 32 anymore. They were running over 400. Uh, we had seen in that revival one night. Uh, they tell me Sand Mountain is the methamphetamine capital of the world. One night there were 23 methamphetamine addicts in the altar seeking deliverance uh, by the power of God and most of them left uh, free from their drug addiction. Amen. Come on somebody. Hallelujah. 
But that's not what I'm, I want to talk about. I want to talk about that, that during that revival, uh, people were coming from everywhere. I saw a uh, pastor, uh, Brother Ron Phillips from uh, Chattanooga, has got a book back there, and he's, uh, he's a spirit-filled Baptist pastor. Well, I didn't know this lady. The church was packed out. They were having to set out in a vestibule. And, and, uh, but we were just having church, ministering in song, ministering through the flow of the Spirit. And all of a sudden, uh, she jumped up. She was sitting back to my left, back on this side, and she jumped up and she began to run and scream. I, I can see, I can see, I can see. I did not know that she was totally blind, but the power of God, what I want you to understand, it wasn't when we deemed we're going to pray for the sick, it's when we embrace the Spirit of God as the body of Christ that the Spirit can move. Let me tell you, God wants to move right now. Hallelujah, if you'll let it. Praise God. You say, Brother Silcox, what are you saying? That's why the scripture has been burning in my heart at Farbar, to it or forth the causeway, and to it Parbar. You see what it's talking about there? It's talking about when, when uh, uh, they were dedicating the temple. Uh, when, uh, when Solomon was bringing dedications into the temple, uh, that uh, the outpost, the farthest outpost, oh, he mentions the priest. Uh, he mentions singers. He mentions the officers. Uh, he mentions the the army list all of the different accolades uh, and places that make up the kingdom uh, but the last thing that he mentioned uh, is that out there the farthest outpost uh, was a was a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper uh, at a place called Farbar Westford and he said there's two at the causeway and four at Farbar Westward. Uh, what he was honoring is those people that kept the gates now I read that for years and said why in God's name uh, would he take the time uh, to mention six people out in no man's land doing their job. First of all, he did that because God knows right where you are. You may not be on man's radar. You may not be getting the publicity you need in your home or on your job, but I've got good news for you. The God you serve knows where you are tonight regardless of where you are. Somebody ought to say amen. Hallelujah. I got to looking at that and I said it can't be that important this uh, gatekeeping situation where where did this come from uh, then God carried me back over in Samuel and Chronicles and I preach this every way I can preach it I preach a sermon about uh, don't take me back to a uh, to a smooth place uh, don't take a dumb ox back to an easy place and I preach that and I preach David bringing the ark of the covenant uh, and all of those things you know that story uh, you know the story that David had been killed king for eight years. He, he didn't even go after the presence of God for eight years. He was busy in war. But when the wars were settled, David realized that he could not rule the kingdom without the anointing and the presence of God. Now let me tell you, if you don't hear anything else I preach, you better hear this. You can't make it without the presence of God. Hallelujah. Oh come on, hallelujah. We don't shout about that much, but that's the truth. Do you understand me when I tell you tonight that, that you have to have the Lord. You know, I go places where they think they're smart enough to handle it. I go places where they think they're pretty enough to handle it. I, I go to some churches that think they're talented enough to handle it. I want to tell you something, friend. If we're going to build God's kingdom, we have to have God's spirit. Amen. Oh, 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 I hear some of you. I hear some of you saying, that's right. We ought to have that spirit in our church. You know the reason we don't have it in the American church? It's it's not because the pastors are failing, it's because you don't have it, amen. You are under obligation to get under the spout where the glory comes out, amen. Oh, I wish we had better church. I can tell you how to have better church, have better home, hallelujah. You see, some of you don't ever pray till you come here. You don't ever read your Bible till you come here. You don't ever shout until you come here. You don't ever speak in tongues until you come here. But David realized that if I am going to have the blessings of God, I've got to have the presence of the Spirit of God. Somebody ought to say amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I, I could quote you statistics that would bother you. Uh, the major Pentecostal denominations, the traditional Pentecostal denominations, Church of God, Assembly of God, Pentecostal Holiness, not putting down on those churches, but I'm telling you today that less than half uh, of their membership population does not know about the inflow or have the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That means tech 
technically they are no longer a spirit led or a spirit directed church now what I'm saying I'm not fussing about that I'm saying if you haven't found the anointing of the spirit of God and got God working in your life tonight is the night to get the business done come on David says, he, see the, the thing that separated David from Saul is Saul never sought the Spirit of God. Saul was a head and shoulders king. And I come back and preach that sometimes. You see, the Bible said Saul stood head and shoulders above all of his uh, 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 individuals or all of his cohorts. Uh, and that, that means more than he was just taller than everybody else. It meant that Saul's strength was in his physique and in his mind, Saul thought he was all of that in a bag of chips and that he could run it by himself. Hallelujah. But that's why God rejected Saul as king. Amen. And that's why God raised David up. Eight years after he's become king, David said something is missing we've got to get. And we believe it must be that little three-foot chest of gold that lay there that has the bowl of hidden manna and Aaron's budded rod and the law of God nestled in its confines we need to give the ark of the covenant because in the past if the ark was there we were blessed and if the ark was there we won the battle and if the ark was there we knew that we were safe oh I want to tell you what if you're not safe and blessed and touched it might be time for you to go back and to get the ark of the spirit of God and bring it back to your house amen and I, I tell you what, I, I'm, I'm feeling the anointing of God. I don't know how long y'all have got tonight. But David goes to get the ark. You know the story. I, I don't want to preach that. I want to make a point, but I have to preach it. And he comes and he puts the ark on a new cart. And uh, we know that's against the law of God. The uh, Bible said the, the Spirit of God has moved on the shoulders of righteous men, uh, on the shoulders of priests. Uh, let me tell you something, friends. Systems do not carry the Spirit of God. Men carry the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. So he put it on an ark. You know the story how they started. They made it to Neshon's threshing floor and there the ark stumbled. The, the oxen stumbled. He stumbled on the smoothest place on the trip. Amen. You don't have to have something really difficult to cause you to stumble if you're trusting in something other than the presence of God. And when the, when the oxen stumbled and the ark shook, it was that young man that reached up hand and held it and, and he died. Uzzah died right there on the spot. And you know what David did? David got angry. We talked about Moses' anger last night. David was not above anger. David got angry. You know why David was angry? David was not angry because a young man died you believe that, you need to go back and read the story. David was angry because the king was embarrassed. The king, his first official move other than fight a war, he was robed, read it, he was robed in his kingly garments and, and he went out there with a big show and display and, and he was saying, man, I'm, I'm somebody now. And God embarrassed him because they had not taken the right steps. And David put the ark right then and there. He put Put the ark aside. He laid it there and left it there. Hallelujah. And he went back to his place. They put the ark at a Gentile's house. Now, let me tell you, he was mad. He didn't even find a Jew to put that ark at his house. He found a, a jet, the first, the first port. Man, oh, oh nation or, or, or no, uh, Obed Edom. He, he didn't have any idea what was going on. Here somebody comes up and sticks this thing up in his house. He hadn't got any clue what it's about. David goes home and for three months he pouts but all of a sudden somebody came in and said David you might want to go back out there where you left the ark and the presence and the comfort and the anointing of God because that guy that Gentile he is being blessed my God he's blessed coming in he's blessed going out he's the head and not the tail the cattle and the kind are blessed he, all of his fields are blessed his servants are blessed his kids are blessed my God God ain't a man in the world blessed any more than this man. Hallelujah. Oh, David realizes we need the Spirit of God. Blessings come when we embrace the Spirit of God into our houses. Hallelujah. Into our lives. And so David goes out to Obed-Edom's house and he takes claim of the ark. Now this time when he comes back, David has learned a few things. 
Now, I'm teaching a little more tonight than preaching. David's learned some stuff. This time, he doesn't wear the king garments. He's not super duper whooper whopper King David. He's taken all of that aside. He's realized it's not about David. It's about God. Hallelujah. When we realize it's not about your church or my church or my position or your position, when we get our eyes off of God being lifted up, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men into me. I don't have time to preach it, but I'd like to tell you what he dressed in when he came back. He was dressed in an ephod. And we made a grave mistake because we don't study the word or understand the word. We've had people preach for years that David is the perfect likeness of Christ because he's king, priest, and prophet. Not so. Oh boy, it got quiet then because all of you have heard that preached. Oh yes, Brother Silcox, David was king. No, if David had tried to be a priest and a king, he would have got the same thing that Saul got. Saul got kicked out of the kingdom because he said if the priest don't show up I can be the priest God said nobody you're anointed to be king you better wait till the priest gets here he acted as a priest and God rejected him now if God did that and then let David act as a priest he's going to have to apologize to Saul but brother Silcox the Bible said distinctly that this time when he came out, he had an ephod, but it was not the ephod of priesthood. All you got to do is go to Israel or the Far East or the Middle East even today, and you'll see that children, until they are bar mitzvah, until they reach the age of 12, they wear a little garment. It's a little tunic, and it's called an ephod, and it barely covers their little neck. Don't look at me like that. You go over there and those kids are playing and their little hineys are shining. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Just a little bit. But, but they wear the ephod of a child. And when you become adult, you put away the childish garments and you put on adult garments. Oh, I'm preaching good now if y'all could get it. When David went back out there, he had really learned his lesson. It wasn't the king's garment, and it wasn't the priest's garment, but he dressed as a little child. Hallelujah. Oh, he had almost, my God, hallelujah, suffer the children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Oh, David had become childlike. Oh, I wish I, I don't want to preach this, but I can't stop there. You know why? You ought to read the rest of it. That's why his wife, Saul's daughter, Michal, that's why she got so upset when David got there and was dancing and his nakedness was showing because he was wearing a childlike garment. She was embarrassed. Oh, but let me tell you what David had realized. I'm not coming to you with my robes and with my titles and with my abilities and my talents. I come to you as a little child. Hallelujah. My God, why don't somebody shout? If that don't make you shout, something's wrong with your shout. So David comes back out in his childlike ephod. And he talks to the priest, and now the priest are bearing the ark upon their shoulders. They're going so many steps and making a sacrifice. And all of a sudden they haven't got a, but a little way from, from Obed Edom's house. And somebody looked over their shoulder and says, what's he doing? He had packed his little suitcase. That's not in the original version, that's in mine. Had his little, his little knapsack, his, uh, his little duffel bag, and he's striking out behind the crowd. Somebody must have went back and said, hey, hey, Mr. Obed Edom, where in the world do you think you're going? He said, wherever that box goes, that's where I'm going. You should have never put it in my house. You should have never let me taste the victory. You should have never let me feel the presence because I can't live without it. You can kill me. You can leave me here. But if you don't, wherever that box 
ox goes, I'm going. I've ta- oh, I wish some of you that have tasted the glory of God would get hungry again to say, I'm going where that spirit leads. I want to preach and shout and you can't do both of them at the same time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he strikes out. Somebody must have mentioned to him, you've lost your mind, Obed. You're not a Jew. He said, how can I get to be one? Oh, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I ain't ever going to be with that group. I ain't ever going to that church. Buddy, if the anointing's there and I'm over there in dead holler, hallelujah, I'm coming over here with this crowd and find, oh, come on now, hallelujah. Life's too short to be where the Spirit of God is not. I've gone to too many dead, twice plucked up by the roots of funeral services that I don't ever want to go back to one that's trying to do it without God. I want to be where I walk in and two or three are gathered together and you feel the anointing of the Spirit in the midst. Hallelujah. It'll take you a while, old man, to be proselytized. What can I do to then? Well, we're carrying the ark to its new new place. Its new place. Now wait. It's David's temple. They have not built a house yet for God. David's temple, I told you last night, is not a divided temple. It's not an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. David's temple is open. It's an open vista. Not only that, in the, in the temple of God Almighty that Solomon will be in, there will be silence. No one will break the silence. You, even when they build it, they carve the stones at the quarry and they set them in silence. No man's voice can be heard. In the temple of Solomon, there is no music. There's no drums. There's no strings. That's where the poor church of Christ fell off the bandwagon. Hallelujah. They forgot that God made a way. Hallelujah. But David, in David's temple, he could play his harp. Hallelujah. And they could sing praise unto God. They could sing, the Lord is my shepherd shepherd and I shall not walk they could dance you couldn't dance in Solomon's temple hallelujah but in David's temple there was dancing and shouting that's what I told you the other night some of you are waiting for the rebuilding of Solomon's temple and it will be rebuilt for Israel's sake but the restoration of David's temple is what the Bible is talking about where we come in and we're not silent but we shout unto the Lord where the instruments Hallelujah. This is the restoration of David's house. But even in that open temple, they said, You can't go in there. He said, How close can I get? They said, Well, I guess. I guess it'd be all right for a Gentile to be a doorkeeper. I'll open the door and close the door. I got a little secret for you. I believe he cheated. Yeah. I believe they told him, said, boy, don't you look in there. You can open the door and close the door. Don't, don't you be looking in there. I believe old bed checked it out. I believe he'd take a peek <laughs> and feel the glory. See, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to preach right here for whosoever will. <laughs> this, this is not an anointing for the chosen few. Hallelujah. This is not the anointing for the super spiritual. This is not a Pentecostal anointing for the denomination. This is whosoever will. Hallelujah. They'll tell you you can't come in. They'll tell you you have to stand at the door. But every now and then if you crack the door, you'll realize that this is like salvation. It's for whosoever would believe on the name of Christ, hallelujah, can be filled. That's what messed us up with you. Man, I feel preached tonight. Woo! You know, that's what messed us up a few years ago when we, we traditional Pentecostals thought we had it all in our little corner. 
nanny, nanny, boo, boo, it's ours. I'll never forget. First Kenneth Copeland meeting I went to. I was drugged against my will to, to uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And then got really messed up. I mean, messed up. And I sat behind four nuns with their habits on. And I thought, what are these old gals doing here in the house? And man, I tell you what, this is, they're, they're about as useless as a screen door in a submarine here. What are you doing? But all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost began to move. And oh, 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 the anointing fell. And, and let me tell you what those four Catholic ladies out shouted every one of those Pentecostals. Hallelujah. Shouted them down. Hallelujah. I, I went to another meeting. Now, hey, wait a minute. I was in a denomination at that time, boy, that you had to look just like they looked or you didn't have anything. I don't guess y'all heard about them up here. We... In the church I was in, we all got our hair, guys all got our hair cut at the same barbershop. Right, we had to look just like the preacher. And, and the other thing of that, a woman better not go to the barbershop. I better stop that now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make somebody upset. I don't mean to make you upset. I'm, I'm, I, that, that was a season in God. That season, I'm not against that. But I'll never forget the very people that would tell me in our minister's meeting, you can't let this stuff go on in your church, this change address. I was sitting in Mobile, Alabama at the little theater at the Mobile Municipal Auditorium. And that guy that had told me that gave out a message in tongues. The lights were low in that auditorium. He didn't know that the woman had interpreted his message that caused for the greatest altar call we had had in one of those meetings in recent years was a gal that they would have thrown out because to them she looked like a Jezebel but God said you can peek in if you want to hallelujah and I will anoint you and she gave out a message and went home and they never knew but I tell you what I knew I left there and saying it's not mine or theirs it's ours through the power of almighty God whosoever will can have the fullness of the spirit that time to just testify more of that than I saw. I received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I had actually finished college and I was taking a senior seminar in the psychology of religion. And uh, long story, but in a Southern Baptist University, and I thank God for the Southern Baptists, they taught me to love the Word. And I read where they stopped. <laughs> and uh, God filled me with the baptism. Went to a little youth camp. It was June the 7th, 1967. It was in the middle of the six-day Israeli war. And I was sitting back there saying, I don't know what this is. And they were singing, a little scrawny guy that is now the minister of music at the Pulaski Pike Church of God in, in Huntsville, Alabama, was singing, Heaven is waiting, waiting for me. All of a sudden, something hit at the front of that church and rolled. See, y'all, that's not for me. You don't understand what I'm talking about. I just sitting back there minding my own business. In fact, I had me a new girlfriend I was sitting by at camp. So, and, uh, and I was trying to, trying to, you know, I had my own tie that I own. Oh, hallelujah. I was trying to be, you know, all of that uh, for her sake. And something jumped on me. I felt goosebumps run up and down my spine. And then it bounced off the back wall and it hit me on the back. And the third time it came around, I said, it hits me one more time. I'm going to go down there and check that out. We Baptists ain't supposed to look, but I'm going to take a peek. Hallelujah. And the next time it hit me, I got up and ran, and I don't ever remember making it to the front of the church. That's when we didn't mind being emotional. When about 2 o'clock in the morning, soaking wet, over in a corner, I, underneath a row of trees, didn't know what I'd done, but I came to speaking in a language, uh, feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life. My life had forever been transformed. Oh, and I said, I ain't going to tell nobody this happened.
went back to my senior seminar. Dr. W.C. Dodd and two professors. One with a PhD in theology, a PhD in uh, in psychology, and a doctorate with a PhD in psychology and a PhD in theology. And he didn't know what had happened to me. I sat on the front row. I had hid my little New Testament. And he pounded my desk and laughed, a belly laughed, and made fun of Pentecostals and then filling the Holy Ghost and said, I wouldn't be Pentecostal for nothing, but they take everything from society and don't give anything into return. Then told a joke. Walked up and down, and they were laughing pretty good with him, and he, found, he had no idea. Pounded my desk again and made some deranging mark, and I, I, I meant something. That same anointing, that same shaking got all over me. And I said, he better not hit my desk again. Because if he does hit my desk again, he'll have to deal with me. Hallelujah. And he started to slap my desk. And I, he looked like he ate something that made him sick. When I jumped up, put out my little New Testament, I said, that's the last disparaging remark I'll hear about the infilling of the Holy Ghost because I can back it up with this book and I can back it up with my experience. Then he grinned as if he was going to chew me up and spit me out in little bitty pieces in front of that 50-something class members that were sitting in that, that uh, uh, room of study. But before he could open open his mouth. Uh, scriptures I have never studied begin to pour out of my mouth. I got him so confused he didn't know what his name was. Uh, Forty-five minutes later the other professor dismissed the class but nobody left uh, and by that time we'd got loud enough that they started coming in out of the hallway. Uh, two hours later the anointing lifted and I walked back across that campus saying I'm a goner I'll never pass now. I'm through. My degree's over. I, I didn't want to see anybody. Went and hid in my room. I, when in about two hours, I, I literally went to sleep in exhaustion after the anointing. Two hours later, I heard a knock on my door. Went to the door. I, and the president of our student body, Ronnie Kemp, he was not Baptist. Uh, he was Episcopalian. Amen. Uh, he looked at me and he said, Curtis Silcox, uh, you don't know me. Uh, he said, until two hours ago, I didn't know there was any such thing as that Holy Spirit you're talking about but we've been having prayer meeting down here and he said every night we pray and all of a sudden we run out of words we cannot tell God we just have no vocabulary you reckon God would give us I said I believe he would I, I guess I don't know I, I just was sitting back there and I don't know how to sing but I'll do something if you went down there and they was all kneeling around and I, I closed the door and just said God, there they are, hallelujah. I, and all of a sudden, uh, the divine anointing fell in that dormitory room. They started shouting. I ran like a scared rabbit, hallelujah. Locked my door and didn't answer it the rest of the night. Uh, revival broke out uh, in that campus, hallelujah. I want to tell you something, friend, when we realize it's for whosoever will. Uh, don't you be pointing your finger and saying this is not real. Uh, it's the most real uh, thing that has ever happened. Uh, this is the anointing. Uh, my spirit he said, I will pour out upon all flesh. He snuck a peek. He snuck a peek. Became a doorkeeper. Then what else he did? He was proselytized in the Jewish family. How you know? Read the book. It's all in there. Oh. Obed-Edom, he, uh, he became the doorkeeper. And if you read in that same area of Chronicles, you'll talk, find out it talks about in his age, he has sired 62 men and his inheritance. When Obed took the job of doorkeeper, it was a nothing job. After he sired 62 young men, it has become the best job in town. For the Bible said all 62 of them followed in their grandfather's footsteps. I don't know how y'all sitting there. I, I guess I'm just preaching to me. I don't know. Do you understand what I just said? They didn't become doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs. Uh, they didn't become. They became doorkeepers uh, in the house of God. All 62 of them said, "My God, it don't get no better than this. We want some of what Grandpa had." Hallelujah! We'll be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Yeah. 
preach here and I, I don't have time to preach. I'm not against education. I thought I was going to be the first one to go to run directly from undergraduate work to old age pension. I have a master's in social psychology. I, I believe in education, but I want to tell you something. You're wanting your kids to have a prestigious name. You want them to be a banker or a lawyer or a doctor. If they're called, that's one thing. But let me tell you what I want my kids to be. When our kids came to us, we prayed over them the day that they knew they were conceived and said, God, we're not raising kids for the world. We're not raising kids to serve the world. We're raising a generation that's going to carry the anointing of God. I can say I have a son that is a youth pastor of our local church. He has over 4,500 people in the church. His youth camp just week before last had over a thousand in his youth camp. My daughter, she's a member and helps us with the ministry here. A teacher teaching the word of God anointed and ordained to preach the gospel. That little girl that went on to be with Jesus never sang one time anything but the glory of God. Hallelujah. She could sing the glory of God down. Now I've got eight grandkids and I can tell you I don't want a doctor out of them. I don't want a lawyer out of them. I don't want an Indian chief out of them. I want anointed men and women of God that will bring the gift of God to another generation. Hallelujah. Man, I could preach there and you wouldn't like it. You better watch sending your kids off to state universities where their sole intention is to destroy their faith. Oh, come on, don't look at me. Oh, I say I'd make you really mad. I don't know why anybody's surprised at what happened at Penn State. It's happening all over this country. When you leave God out of any process, Satan will reign. Let me tell you what, if you could pull the cover over that dirty little secret in the university, you would see what's going on in the dorms. You'd see what's going on between professors and their students. You'll see what's taking place. And I'd say, my God, no, I'm not giving my child to that. Oh, come on, I know, I know some of you. Some of you have already labeled me as an idiot right now. I'll put my degree with yours. I'll put my IQ with yours. What I'm saying is uh, they found out there's something more important. And what's important is us building the kingdom of God for his glory. That time to preach. What does a doorkeeper do? He guards the door. He's not just sitting there. He guards the door. He protects from the onslaught that would infringe upon the anointing that is just beyond him. Oh, I wish I had time to preach right now. That means the doorkeeper's got to have some conviction. Brother Silcox, can I do that and go to heaven? You didn't told you last night you cannot do it and go to heaven. I've got convictions that if I were to tell you what they were, you'd laugh at me. You know why? They're my convictions. They're not meant for me to impose upon you. There's some places I can't go that you can go to. You know why I can't go there? I know my flesh. Well, come on. I, 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 I don't fuss at anybody going to those places that I can but I know my weakness see, see you need to understand you've got some weaknesses and if you've got some weakness you don't go where that weakness will be called on so there's some places that I can't go because I have fleshly weaknesses that would cause me to succumb you see I have to have some convictions and you see but there's some things that we need to realize that God has told us that we're going to stand for there has to be somebody that says no nah, that's it that's as far as we're going amen and we, we're not going to give up any other territory. We're going to stand here. We're going to live righteous. We're going to live holy. We're going to walk right. We're going to talk right. We're going to serve God. Hallelujah. I'm not going any further. I'm guarding the door. Hallelujah. For what's behind me is more important than what the world has to offer. And the world has no place. I know you're cringing, baby. All is cringing. She said, hey, they're going to think you're weird. I don't care what you think. You understand that? I'll guard the door. Nobody gets up and preaches and says, I can, I can go out and drink and 
I can commit adultery and it's all right. Grace is sufficient for me. I'll jump up and slam the door in his face and tell the world, you can't come in. Hallelujah. The Bible says, for thou shalt not commit adultery. Hallelujah. The Bible said, be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Bible said, avoid the very appearance of evil. Let me tell you, some of you have crossed the line, but the doorkeepers are saying, no, no, no. That's as far as we're going. We're going to protect the anointing. And I can preach it and get more personal. I won't. They guard against the evil. They keep those from coming in that are not ready to come in. We don't need to do that, but Joe Cox, careful now what you're going to preach here because it's no. Let me tell you what, if you're not ready entering into the pure presence of God to get you killed. Hey, wait a minute, y'all looking at me like I know what they're saying, don't ever get him back. They've already invited me and I've accepted. I said. The gorekeeper keeps those that would be destroyed by the anointing. I've seen them want to rush in before anyone taught them what they ought to do or they'll get killed in here. Wait, wait a minute. See, see, some of you don't believe that because we don't preach that in American modern theology. The Bible said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. This ain't some, some statue. This ain't some statuary. This ain't some, some symbol of God. We're talking about entering into the, to the divine connection of the Spirit of Almighty God. Perfect love casts out fear, Brother Shulker. You better go back and read Perfect Love Cast Out Trepidation. But perfect love does not cast out reverential fear. I want to tell you something and you hear me right now. What I fear more than anything on the face of this earth. I've had a Uzi laid on the brand of, uh, on my, my uh, temple uh, in Russia and in broken English. A Russian tell me if I get up and preach tomorrow he's going to blow my blankety blank brains out. I have been arrested in Jordan. I've been arrested uh, in uh, Nigeria. I've been arrested in Egypt. I know what it is. And I tell you what uh, but there's not, I don't fear that. I'm over that fear. Kill me. It's a short trip to glory, hallelujah, but I'll tell you what I do fear, I fear entering unworthy before him that holds not just my life in his hands, but holds my eternity, I tremble in the presence of God. Johnny, come lately, half cock wants to run in. I heard this idiot, excuse me, I heard this brother idiot on the radio saying, I know my rights, I just go in the presence of God and demand what's mine. He is a blooming idiot. Maybe a saved one, but he's a blooming one. Son, when you enter into the presence of God, look, look, John the Revelator, John the Beloved, he that laid his head upon the chest and the breast of Christ, that had the closest relationship of any man that's ever walked the face of the earth. But when he showed up in his resurrected glory, John said, I fell as a dead man in his presence. Come, on. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Don't come up here if you're playing games. Don't come up here if you're just trying to get your wife back so you can act like you've got the anointing of God. Come on, folks. It happens every day. Don't come up here because you're liable to die up here. Won't you preach the New Testament? I'm fixing to. Fixing to South Alabama for a while. I'm about to preach that for you. When they conspired against God, somebody should have been watching the door because they wouldn't have died if they hadn't said, You better check yourself. There should have been some discernment and said, You better not lie up there. You can lie out here, but you better not lie up there. 
But he went up and he lied and he said, we've sold the land for this month. And he fell dead and they took his body off. And when they came back from burying him, there was Sapphire standing before the same council and gave the same line. She fell dead. Spirit and the anointing and the power of God is all that means anything to me. If you're not serious about this, you need to you need to go on. Does that sound too harsh? Doorkeeper keeps evil, keeps those that are not ready. The doorkeeper also opens the door for those who would receive. That's why Matthew 19, 16 is so important. What you bind will be bound. I have the right to bind you. I have the right to loose too. In order to loose those that want to come and open the door so they can enter in. You are the gatekeeper. Mm. Can I tell you something else? I'm skipping. I, I, I'm, I'd never cover this all in one sermon. Obed Edom, after 62 kids, he had a, had a son by the name of Shenaniah. And by this time, that we're getting over here in Chronicles, and they're setting up the order of the house. By the way, by the way, do you know where doorkeepers come in the order of the house? See, see most of you hadn't even read that there is an order in our God's a God of order. There's an order that he works with, and the Old Testament gives that order. If you read the Old Testament, when it's listed in the order of the house, who is always listed first in the order of the house? Priest. Priest. Those after the order of Melchizedek, those after the order of Aaron, those after they're listed. You know who's listed second, by the way? Some of you already shout. The singers are always listed second. That's the praisers. You see, there's some people called praise. Hallelujah. You ever seen somebody praise that just had it? Man, I've watched people. I, 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 when we first started years ago, 22 years ago, evangelizing in a van and, and, and had the kids in tow, uh, my, my, my kids would tell me after every Holy Ghost field service, Daddy, don't, for God's sake, don't dance anymore. They said, You look like a wounded ostrich. I don't know what a wounded ostrich is like. I said, I don't care what I look like. I ain't, I'm not dancing for your looking and listening and joy. But have you ever seen those singers and dancers that have the gift of praise? Oh, oh, oh I said, I said, I said, oh, 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 oh. But you say, see, I can't do it, but I can rejoice in those that can. I can rejoice in. But then after priest mm, and after singers, before deputies of the house, before treasurers, before the important listings, before the soldiers, doorkeepers are always listed third. And I never heard anybody preach a sermon on be a doorkeeper in the house. How did we miss that? Shenaniah is the offspring of Obed. Obed has been faithful to opening and closing and guarding. But now comes a time there are so many people that want to be doorkeepers. When he started, didn't anybody want his job? Now there's a whole lot in an entire chapter of families that want to get in on the deal. You know what I want to live? I want to live so that somebody would want my anointing if God takes me before the rapture takes place and that someday I'll look down and see hundreds that have said we saw him. Not him, but Christ in him. Yeah. 
Shenaniah. I got to close. Shenaniah. Now there's so many that wants to be that they have to draw lots. <laughs> I know where I'm going. That's why I'm doing it. They have to draw lots to see who's going to get to keep what gate. I don't think it's an accident that Shenaniah draws the eastern gate. I'm talking, oh, I'm, see, some of you ain't got a clue. You hear me and you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a doorkeeper. Woo! <laughs> I'm talking about a place in God that God wants to call some of you as a doorkeeper tonight. You see, he, he got to lock the lot fell on the eastern gate. Somebody said, I can't got time to preach it all the way through the Bible, but the eastern gate called the gate beautiful. Hallelujah. By the way, if you go to Israel today, it is got blocked up, it's shut, it's closed but it's not going to stay closed hallelujah, one of these days he's going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air and so shall they ever be with the Lord and when he comes back to this earth that door is going to be open, hallelujah and those of us that are of the lineage of Obed-Edom, hallelujah we not only close the door to the enemy. We not only kept those unworthy out. We not only opened up the door for those that would come in. We're going to get to open the door for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Oh, I said Jehovah sent me. Hallelujah. Paul, I, I, I'm not through, but I'll close. Now I've got to go home and live with this rest of the night. This, this was all over me. I tried to take a nap this afternoon. I wadded up coming, all coming, snorting. I've changed my appetite. Miss Ewan will come sing with me. Sing something for me. Out gatekeepers, doorkeepers, or something. For years, if God tarries, and I don't go the way of rapture and I go the way of the grave, by the way, get over it. Brother Shilcox, I'm not going to die. Yes, you are. You're going to die. Oh, no, I'm going in the rapture. You're going to die. Go back and read the story. He said, you shall be changed. This mortal shall put on immortality. It will be a quick death, but there's only one way out of here is dying. The mortal has to lay down to take on the immortal, and you'll die in the rapture. So, die here, die there. We used to sing an old gospel song that said, death ain't no big deal. To the believer, it ain't no big deal. It's to be absent in his body, to be present with Christ. Just step through the veil. Hallelujah. But if I go the way of the grave, I'd always thought that my epitaph would be the third verse of my Jesus, I love thee. And it would have read this way and Paula would have had to have a lot of money to buy a tombstone that big, but this is what I wanted on it. I love thee in life. I love thee in death. And I praise thee as long as thou didst lend me breath. But said, death's dew laid cold. If ever... I love thee, my Jesus. Did anybody get that? Did anybody understand? I thought it wasn't possible that I could love him more today than I did yesterday, but I do. I don't care what the circumstances are. But I've changed. I'm going to get Paula a cheaper tombstone to buy. A tombstone will have one word. Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper. What an honor to wear gatekeeper. <laughs> Faithful to the gate. I 
out at Farbar Westford or at the causeway and two at Farbar. Can I give you one more scripture? David, who wore the royal raiment, the greatest king of all of Israel, from his lineage would come a Messiah, the king of kings. Psalms 84 and 10, don't turn there, it's in there. It's like rag goods in there, read it when you get home. Somebody looked one day and said, David, you had it to do over again. If you could choose, would you choose the royal regalia, the kingship? It's not recorded, but I believe David looked back at the door. And old man had his head hanging around. And he said one day, one day in his presence is worth a thousand elsewhere. Then he smiled and he said, if I had it to do over with, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God to dwell in the tents of the Everybody together, I love you, Lord. 